On February 21st, 1984, pop culture as we know it almost changed dramatically. The movies we watch, the shows we binge, the games we play, and the comics we read today could have all been entirely different because of a decision that was nearly made. 34 years ago today, at the time this video is coming out, Marvel Comics almost bought their most significant competitor, DC Comics. This history-altering deal was so close to becoming a reality. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and more could have all become Marvel superheroes alongside the Avengers. But then, the deal was canceled. Marvel got cold feet and backed off. Unbelievably, they didn't think DC's characters were good enough to purchase. It's one of those incredible stories that defines the comic book industry's insane, surreal history. So much so that you've probably heard this story passed around the internet for years. There's just one problem, though. The story, it's not really true. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here. You know, when I started making videos ages ago, I wanted to combat those comic book fact accounts on Twitter and Instagram who post secondhand trivia about comic books with no sources to a massive audience of nerds who regurgitate that info in a game of telephone until no one even knows what's true anymore. And you know, you guys really seem to like our video where we debunked some trivia about Heath Ledger's Joker, so I figured today we can try it again by talking about this tweet that was sent to me by at Shermer I am... Definitely pronouncing that wrong. The myth claims that in 1984, Marvel had the chance to buy DC Comics, but declined because DC's characters weren't popular enough. Okay, so this is so misleading that I am actually physically annoyed. I am shaking with frustration. Whew. So today, let's end this inaccuracy and give you the real story behind Marvel's deal to buy DC Comics because the reality is infinitely more interesting than this ridiculous factoid. Last I checked, the best place to start is at the beginning to gather what most social media trivia accounts hate, context. Am I being passive aggressive or just regularly aggressive? Anyway, like a lot of critical moments in comic book history, this story begins in times of struggle. As I'm sure we all know, the comic book industry has struggled in one way or another since the 1950s, and by the early 80s, DC Comics in particular was not doing so hot. Despite huge success with its brand new series, The New Teen Titans, the company wasn't gaining much traction. In fact, it was losing millions of dollars every year. The fire that had lit DC's empire for decades was starting to dim quickly, and DC's parent company, Warner Communications, took notice. The higher-ups started to wonder if comic publishing was really worth the cost. Maybe they could scrap the comic books altogether and just license the superheroes to forces outside of the comic book industry. The general public knew who Superman was without needing to buy Superman 424, even though that cover is rad. The point is, Superman the movie had become a sensation with audiences years earlier, rocketing the character's popularity into the stratosphere. And sure, the public by and large didn't really seem to be interested in Batman or Wonder Woman comics, but the Batman TV show from the 60s made a huge cultural impact, and the Wonder Woman series also made waves on the air in the 70s. So maybe soups, bats, and ones? Maybe they had all transcended their original medium and belonged elsewhere, right? Preferably an industry that was a little more stable and profitable than comics. Of course, like any business, the writing was on the wall for all employees to see, and DC's financial fumbling was pretty obvious. Rumors of a complete DC shutdown circled the comic book company's offices for years. As one DC editor put it, quote, there were rumors of that every single week I worked at DC, end quote. So that's not great. As a YouTuber, I can emphasize with that. I can emphasize with that. Please subscribe. Meanwhile, over at Marvel Comics, it was a much different story. The House of Ideas was flooding the market with tons of diverse and varied characters, a practice that afforded them a lot of success, along with other not as pleasant things that we'll talk about in a minute. But this was the era when Daredevil came into his own and the X-Men became a fan favorite franchise that it remains today. Marvel wasn't licensing its characters as much as DC was, not yet anyway, but they had done very well with the Spider-Man brand, especially in televised animation. Either way, Marvel work in comics was still making a lot of money. And all of this was happening under editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, because if there's a story about the mainstream comic book industry, it probably involves Jim Shooter in some capacity. He's always lurking in the shadows, waiting, watching, plotting. 
Seems like a nice guy. In February of 1984, as the rumors about DC's closure made their way into Marvel's offices, Shooter got a call from a guy named Bill Sarnoff. Now, Sarnoff was not DC's editor-in-chief or even the president of DC Comics. Sarnoff was the chairman of Warner Communications publishing arm, Warner Books, and he had an interesting proposal. License DC's publishing rights to Marvel, effectively giving Marvel complete control over DC Comics' cast of characters, which you might notice is not the same as Marvel buying DC Comics. And this, my wonderful nerds, is just one notable discrepancy of many, a critical detail often missed when covering this story. Marvel was never on the verge of purchasing its competitor. It was only ever close to having creative control over DC's most popular characters, in comics, not movies or TV or video games. It wasn't a buyout, it was a licensing deal. The only thing that would have changed would have been who's in control of the comics specifically. And I know that to some of you that might seem insignificant, but just wait, because there are way more misconceptions that we have yet to debunk. Comic misconceptions, if you will. I even put it in the title again because you guys you guys wouldn't stop bugging me about it. Yep, that's just regular aggression, sorry. Anyway, this wasn't the first time a deal like this had been offered, but it was the first time that Jim Shooter was involved, and he was all in. He enthusiastically took the idea to Marvel's then president, Jim Galton, who in turn contacted Sarnoff to promptly call off the deal. Why Why would he do that, though? How, how could he possibly turn down a deal like this? Well, uh, do you remember how that factoid from earlier claimed that Marvel believed DC's characters weren't popular enough? That part, surprisingly, is actually kind of true. Although it is worth noting that saying they weren't popular enough is a bit misleading. The cultural impact of DC's superhero lineup didn't really have anything to do with Galton's decision to pass on the offer. Instead, Galton deemed that Batman, Superman, and the rest of DC's pantheon must not be very good characters because they weren't selling issues. It's all about that bottom line, son. But while that is where the factoid ends, this story is far from over. I mean, just look at that time code down there. We've got nine minutes left. After Jim Galton expressed his disinterest in the deal, the other Jim of the Shooter variety was in disbelief. Shooter knew that the DC Universe was unquestionably a valuable property, but the wrong people were at the wheel. Shooter claimed, quote, we can make them work. End quote. Jim Shooter spent three days putting together a game plan that would hopefully persuade others at Marvel to pull the trigger on this deal, a presentation that showed how the company would approach the DC Universe if the deal went through. He wrote it all up in a memo and presented it to Marvel's executive VP of Business Affairs, Joe Calamari. Incredibly, this surviving document is, as far as I can tell, the only physical evidence we have that this deal was a real thing that almost happened. It was graciously provided by Jim Shooter himself over on his blog, which is absolutely worth a read for more wild stories like this. Oh, and hey, look at what the subject line is, buying DC Comics. So maybe this is where the confusion comes from. Darn it, Jim? Back on track. The proposed plan was as follows. Marvel would print seven initial titles, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Teen Titans, Justice League, and the Legion of Superheroes. If it took off, they could always expand the lineup later. Shooter projected that the comics would sell 39 million copies, raking in three and a half million dollars during the first two years alone. He even anticipated the new jobs that the deal would create at the company. And to top it all off, Shooter outlined the licensing agreement that would have mirrored Marvel's hold on Star Wars comics at the time. At the end of the day, the deal was pitched as a win-win. Warner was going to get lots of money and have their characters revitalized, while Marvel was going to make lots of money revitalizing those characters. Shooter also believed this licensing deal would be, quote, the elimination of an irritation. End quote. There's ah, that friendly rivalry we know and love. Joe Calamari was convinced, but Galton was still skeptical of these projected sales numbers. To see if Shooter's analysis was correct, Galton sent the plan to Marvel's circulation department for a review. And what do you know? They agreed that Shooter's numbers were off, like way off. The sales team was confident that there was no way Marvel was gonna be pulling in $3.5 million from this deal. Realistically, they could only probably make double that or more. Yeah, they thought Shooter was being way too conservative, which I guess is the best criticism that you can receive with something like this. And with exciting news like that, it was impossible to keep this deal a secret for long. Word of a possible DC licensing agreement reached Marvel's ground level offices and the excitement was palpable. The very idea of Marvel writers and artists telling Batman stories or creating scenarios for those hip new Teen Titans had more than enough potential to fuel the creative 
fires in the house of ideas. Shooter even claims that John Byrne, a significant writer and artist at Marvel, had proactively drawn up a Marvel Presents Superman comic cover. Fully drawn, fully inked, ready to go. Needless to say, everyone was boarding the hype train at Marvel Comics. Nobody was saying that DC's characters weren't popular enough anymore. The numbers came in, the higher-ups were happy, and the creators could not contain their enthusiasm. Negotiations between them and Warner Books commenced in the weeks to follow, and it looked like everything was in place for a historic change in the comic book industry. But obviously, it didn't happen. So why? What was the reason why this deal didn't come to fruition? Well. There's something you need to know. During this time, and even throughout the negotiation of this entire process, something had been haunting Marvel Comics, and it prevented them from signing on that dotted line. Remember earlier when I said that Marvel was flooding the comic book market? Here's a clip. The House of Ideas was flooding the market with tons of diverse and varied characters. Yeah, that was not an exaggeration. According to Shooter, Marvel held nearly 70% of the comic book industry's market share in the early 80s. For reference, that's around the same percentage that Marvel and DC had in the comic book industry in 2017 combined. And that sounds impressive, but it created a bit of a paradox where Marvel was in such healthy condition that it was starting to become a problem. You see, when a company becomes that dominant in a particular market, it can potentially violate antitrust laws. Without proper competition, a company can effectively become a monopoly, and Marvel was on its way to completely engulfing the comic book industry. However, a little independent publisher called First Comics took notice. In the spring of 1984, First Comics filed a lawsuit against Marvel Entertainment, claiming that the company had indeed violated antitrust laws, intentionally trying to flush out independent comic book publishing. Their case went something like this. So at this point in the comic book industry, the direct market, i.e. comic book stores, had become a prevalent method of getting more independent titles to comics fans. But retailers had a monthly budget for their shelves, and First Comics claimed that Marvel was putting out as many comics as possible to exhaust those budgets and keep independent publishers like First out of this new and very profitable market. Now, the legitimacy of this claim is debatable, but regardless, it was a heavily publicized story at the time. The accusation of a Marvel monopoly Try, I can't do air quotes, apparently, was in the air. So now, smash cut back to Marvel in talks to gain creative control and publishing rights of their most significant competitor. Yeah, suddenly the lawyers in the room were getting pretty nervous. Swallowing even more of the market while you're in the midst of a legal battle where you're being accused of having too much control of the market already? doesn't really look great. And this, my wonderful nerds, is the real reason why Marvel's licensing deal with DC was called off and quickly forgotten. Not because, oh, lol, Marvel thought Batman was silly or whatever. Marvel had to deal with the first comics lawsuit for pretty much the rest of the decade, finally resolving the suit in 1988. And that allowed DC Comics the time to make an incredible comeback. For two years after the proposed Marvel licensing deal, DC released two of the most influential comic book stories ever told, The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen. These two publications supercharged the market and changed comics forever. The impact of these two tales is so substantial that you can still see DC's affection for the material today in comic shops and on the silver screens around the world. And just spare a moment to let that sink in. Because if this deal had become a reality, those stories might not have been created. With Marvel putting a focus on those seven mainstream family-friendly titles, darker niche characters would have been tossed out for the time being. Titles that shined in DC's Vertigo imprint, like Sandman, Swamp Thing, and Animal Man would have never been printed. Pretty much everything under Marvel, especially under Jim Shooter, would have been squeaky clean and safe for the whole family. No grit, no edge. And that would have rippled out to the rest of culture that was inspired by the darker comics that DC put out. Think of how many freaking Batman movies lifted inspiration from The Dark Knight Returns alone. And honestly, that just scratches the surface. Let me know in the comments other ways that pop culture would have been different today if this deal had gone through. And also, would you have liked to see Marvel become the sole publisher of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman comics, and other DC characters for that matter? I would love to know what you're thinking down in the comments below, and I'll respond to some of them in the next comment response video. I promise I'm still making those. We've just been having some technical difficulties. And also, let me know any other suspicious comic book or superhero trivia you want debunked or explained, either down below 
below or on Twitter. We make new videos every week, so hit that big sexy subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell to join the notification squad so you and I can chat in the comments as soon as a new video goes live. You can tell I'm putting an emphasis on comments. I like comments. I like your comments. I like you. That's how it works. As always, I want to thank our patrons who keep this show going, especially Christopher Lang, Keaton Lampert, Elizabeth Monsell, Everett Parrott, and the rest of the wonderful nerds over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Click or tap right here to see our video debunking trivia from The Dark Knight. Alternatively, right down here is a video YouTube's mysterious algorithm thinks you individually will enjoy. Let's test it out and see how well it knows you. Thanks for watching, you wonderful nerds. My name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. I am really shaking.